Hello everyone and welcome to the third day in our series of seminars from the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health. I'd like to welcome you today, particularly on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. My name is Deborah Loxton and I'm the Deputy Director of the study based at the University of Newcastle. I'm joined, I'm joined today by Dr. Janani William, who is a Senior Lecturer of Actuarial Studies and advisor to the Social Outcomes Lab. janani has been using um, her actuarial expertise to do some amazing analyses using longitudinal study data, which we'll see a little bit later on. Both she and I are passionate about seeing a world where women can live free of violence. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We extend acknowledgement to the Awabakal people of the land on which the University of Newcastle resides, the Wanarua people of the land on which I live and work, the Ngunnawal people of the land on which Canberra, Canberra is located, and the Turrbal and Yuggera peoples of Brisbane. So the format today will be a video presentation that Janani and I prepared last week. I will start um, this presentation by providing an overview of the data that we've collected over the past 12 months, so by way of an update following on from the presentation I gave last year, and an overview of domestic violence prevalence, and also some early results from our COVID surveys um, with regard to interpersonal violence. Janani is going to be talking about healthcare costs of domestic and family family and domestic violence, um, as I mentioned before, using some fairly novel methods um, in order to determine those costs over time. I ask today that if you have questions to please post them using the poll ev, and you can see on the slide that the uh, web address there is pollev.com forward slash ALSWH study 916 or the link that was emailed to you. We ask that you please keep your microphones and cameras muted. I also want to mention that the content of this presentation obviously includes information about women's experiences of violence. So please practice self-care. Leave if you wish and contact 1800RESPECT if, if you or someone you know has experienced violence. Hello, this presentation is about the health impacts of violence against women and impacts on the health system. I'm Deb Loxton and I'll first be introducing the topic as well as providing an update on information about intimate partner violence that has been gathered by the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health. Following that short introduction, Dr. Janani William is going to present some of her in-depth research on the health system costs of domestic violence in Australia. The prevalence of domestic violence in Australia as captured by the Australian Longitudinal Study in Women's Health shows some stark differences between younger women and women who are older. I presented some of this data last year and this year um, we can see that the prevalence has increased a little for women who are aged 24 to 29 at 16% to equal that of women aged 40 to 45 also reporting 16% who have ever lived with a violent partner. The figure is slightly less for women who are aged 68 to 73 at 13% and quite a lot less for women who are aged 70 to 75 at 6%. And I will just note that that measure was taken in 1996 and hasn't been um, asked of the older women since that time. Some of the differences in reporting relate to women's understanding of what violence is. The definitions of intimate partner violence have broadened um, over the past 20 to 30 years and younger women um, interpret more acts of violence as violence than do women who are older. These are some of the many outcomes of domestic violence that we have measured using data from the longitudinal study. They include a wide range of psychological problems, including depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation and self-harm as well as a diverse range of physical health disorders, including breathing problems, respiratory conditions more generally, cervical cancer and surgical menopause. And we've also found relationships with health behaviour and in particular smoking. So your tobacco use is much higher among women who have experienced intimate partner violence. The prevalence of interpersonal violence during the COVID-19 pandemic has been measured by our fortnightly surveys. We captured these data on the 6th of August, 
So in about the middle of the data collection that we have been undertaking this year. We'll be talking more about that in our Friday seminar session. But for today, I thought you'd be interested to know that 2% of women in the cohorts born 1946 to 51, 1973 to 78 and 1989 to 95 reported that they were forced to do things that they did not want to do. 1% of women reported that they that someone tried to harm or hurt them during the COVID-19 crisis. 2% reported that they were, afraid, they were afraid of someone that they were close to. And 7% reported verbal abuse in the form of being um, yelled at or being called names to or being put down. By way of a research update, during this year, Anne Rose has funded the longitudinal study to examine sexual violence in detail over the next two years in a project called a life course approach to determining the prevalence and impact of sexual violence in Australia. We also made a submission and gave evidence to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs um, into family, domestic and sexual violence. These are some of the recent publications that we've had over the past 12 months um, in relation to intimate partner and other acts of violence. Um, if you would like a copy of any of these reports or papers, please let us know and we'll be happy to forward them to you. Um, this slide, of course, will be available afterwards for you to have a look at. And there's my email address, should you want to email me. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Janani William, who is going to be talking in detail about the health system costs associated with intimate partner violence. Thank you, Deb. I'm now going to speak on some research that we recently completed on the lifetime health system costs of intimate partner violence. Uh, the work is currently under review at an academic journal, and you'll see the co-authors listed on this slide. Now, before I start, there are two major themes that I will speak to today. The first is the strength of using the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health linked with other administrative data sets like the MBS and PBS. Uh, and this type of quantitative research is really not possible uh, without such data. So for those that weren't at the previous two days of the symposium and who aren't familiar with the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health, or OLSH as I'll refer to it as, uh, there are four generational cohorts uh, that are surveyed over time. The older three cohorts have been surveyed from 1996. And I use all of those three cohorts in this work, but I will focus mainly on the 1973 to the 1978 cohort uh, for this work. Uh, the second major theme that I speak to today is the long-term or the lifetime impacts of violence against women. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share this particularly today on International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. So if I start with the motivation, uh, it's fairly clear that the adverse physical and mental health impacts of IPV has been well established in academic literature. And I'd say that that's true both in Australia and internationally as well. Um, and a recent ALSH study by Professor Loxton herself finds that not only do these adverse impacts exist, but they occur across generations and they persist in the long term. So specifically, Deb and her team find that women who have lived with IPV reported poorer health, sorry, poorer mental health, physical function and general health and higher levels of bodily pain. The physical health differences persisted for the two uh, cohorts born 1973 to 78 and 1946 to 51 across the 16 year study period. Uh, now, this is a really striking finding. And again, this research also was only possible because they were able to study uh, generations uh, and longitudinal data uh, for the same cohort of women to see how the impact played out over time. Uh, similar studies where data has been available uh, internationally have had similar findings. And I'd say there's now a growing evidence base supporting the long-term health impacts of IPV. However, there are a few studies that consider whether or how these adverse health impacts translate to increased health costs over the lifetime. And I do emphasize that lifetime part. 
So you might be aware of economic costing studies of domestic violence that are conducted at the national level. Uh, these studies generally employ an aggregate top-down approach. Uh, so they use average or unit costs over a short period, usually an annual period. Some do extrapolate to look at lifetime costs, uh, but they generally also employ a top-down methodology. Now, one of the advantages of what we're able to do is look at a bottom-up or a ground-up approach uh, because of the ALSH data. So this effectively allows us to quantify costs for each individual and we use actuarial methods to project lifetime costs. So the aim of our research is to quantify the lifetime health system cost of women who experience IPV and compare this cost to women who don't experience IPV. And I refer to this difference between these two groups as the cost differentials. It's also worthwhile ensuring we really understand uh, this definition of lifetime health system cost. Uh, so it's defined from the perspective of government and it includes, and we do this in three separate studies, uh, the benefits that are paid through Medicare, through MBS for out of hospital services, often referred to as the rebates. Also the benefits paid through PBS for pharmaceuticals is considered in a separate uh, study. Both of these studies are covered in our first paper. Uh, and the third study, uh, which we're currently working on, looks at hospital costs. But again, all of them are from the perspective of government. And today I'll speak about the results of the first two. So how do we do this? As I mentioned before, the data to do this type of research is absolutely critical. Uh, so we construct a unique and comprehensive data set using the ALSH surveys linked with records from the MBS uh, from 1996 to 2018 and the PBS, uh, which is linked from 2002 to 2018, for the, nine, for the cohort born 1973 to 1978. So to just dwell on this a bit more, uh, what we effectively have is all participants that are eligible for, for the study from this cohort uh, that have been surveyed every three or four years from 1996 uh, to 2018 linked with a complete history of their health records uh, from the MBS and the PBS over the timeframes identified here. Now this type of data is really gold for an actuary like me. I'm very much used to working with such granular data, that means uh, data at that unit or individual record level. Uh, and the other really beautiful thing about this data is that we're able to derive or obtain costs directly from those two administrative data sets, from the MBS and the PBS. Uh, so that data is very robust and reliable, and we simply need to inflate those costs. Uh, when I say costs here, I'm now referring to the definition that I just went through. We're talking about benefits paid from the perspective of government, and we inflate those costs to 2020 AUD using AAHW inflation rates uh, that are available from their Medicare or their expenditure reports. Now, in terms of the definition of IPV, we use a lifetime measure from the ALSH surveys. Uh, and the question is asked in every ALSH survey in the young cohort, and it says, have you ever been in a violent relationship with a partner or spouse? Now, the method that we use to quantify lifetime costs is an actuarial approach. Those that are familiar with the Australian Priority Investment Approach to Welfare uh, would be familiar with the type of approach that we've used. Uh, the methodology uh, is very similar. Uh, it is quite complex, although for our model, it's not as complex as what you'll be seeing in the welfare modeling. We build a micro simulation model to project annual costs and annual health costs here for each eligible participant in the young cohort each year until death. And I think the, the next two points are better discussed uh, by looking at this diagram. So if you think of every participant in the young cohort, and we had 7,557 that were eligible for this study, they're aged 18 to 23 in 96, and that's the starting year of our lifetime cost. Uh, and we're projecting costs every year until death. But again, an advantage of this data is that we already have cost data until 2018. 
uh, NBS starts a bit earlier than PBS. And we call this the actual costs. Uh, it's, it's actual costs, raw data from the data set that we've inflated to 2020. So the modeling, so this part doesn't actually need to be modeled, it's used within our models for the projection. So the micro simulation is really about projecting future costs. So they're the costs that occur after 2018 um, to death. So there are two major inputs into the micro simulation model. And the first one is what I've labeled here as transitions into states. Uh, so for each future year of life, a woman can enter into various states. So she can transition into the death state, she can transition into a chronic illness state, uh, and she can also transition from no IPV to IPV. So if a woman has experienced IPV by 2018, uh, she stays that way until death because we have used a lifetime measure of IPV, but she can also transition from the no IPV state into IPV later in life. Now, again, one of the benefits of using this ALSH data is that we were able to use older ALSH cohorts uh, to provide insight into what these transition rates could be. Uh, and again, uh, I would say that those sorts of rates by age are very difficult to derive without uh, data on older ages. And that's effectively what you need uh, to work out what these transition probabilities is what we refer them to as would look like. Now the death one is uh, available more readily. Uh, we can look at mortality tables uh, to derive what those rates could be. Now the second major input into the micro simulation model is of course the cost models. So we use a fairly modern statistical technique. Uh, we use gradient boosting methods. Some may be familiar with this, uh, but it essentially assigns a cost or predicts a cost for each future year for each individual uh, based on the state they're in and their age. Uh, so the cost models have explanatory factors like uh, previous cost. So we use the woman's cost history to, term to determine what her future cost is going to be. Uh, it has her age, uh, and their chronic illness status, and we also do the models separately by IPV status. Uh, what we found is that the GBMs start to lose predictive power after about 10 years, so we revert back to a simple inflationary model uh, after that to do uh, the prediction for the final years of the woman's life. So ultimately, we end up with a cost for each future year of life for each woman, which can be used to calculate the lifetime cost. Now I'm gonna share with you the results of uh, the micro simulation, the modeling, but I'm gonna start with just looking at the actual or the annual, the actual annual costs, uh, which we looked at within our exploratory analysis. So before we've really done any specific modeling. So if we look at the results for MBS, on the left here, I've got the cohort of women that experienced IPV at the first survey at 96. So we've labeled them IPV base. And on the right, we've got the cohort of women that experience IPV later in life. So they don't experience IPV in 96, but they do report violence by 2018. And I think the results for both groups are striking. Uh, it's very clear that there's a cost differential between women who experience IPV and women who don't, regardless of when the IPV exposure was, whether it was earlier or later in life. Uh, these cost differentials are around 20 to 40% each year. We also did uh, significance tests and found they were statistically significant each year, as you can see there by the error bars on the mean cost. Uh, the other interesting thing to note here is that the cost differentials don't appear to be flattening over time and they persist for the 23 year study period. And this is particularly important for the IPV base group that have experienced IPV very early in life. Um, you see that the cost differential still persists over 20 years after the IPV exposure. Uh, so the average uh, cost differential for all the years by IPV status is about 20%. Uh, and finally, before I move on, the other really interesting finding uh, came with the IPV end cohort, where we observed a statistically significant mean cost differential even before the first report of violence. So if you bear in mind this group, 
don't report violence at that first survey, but do later on. Uh, what we see here is that uh, those women who have high health costs in young adulthood may be at risk of experiencing IPV at a later date. It may also indicate the occurrence of earlier adversity or abuse that precedes the report of violence. Now, there's other research that Deb and others have done that have had similar findings, not focused on cost, uh, but this uh, finding that there is um, earlier adverse or abuse that could precede a report of violence is something that we want to do more work on. Uh, so if we move to PBS now, what we see here is that it displays more variability um, and we believe that's due to the lower amounts. So PBS represents a lower or a smaller proportion of the total health cost. But we still observe higher annual mean costs by IPV status for most years. Uh, the notable exception is uh, for women whose IPV exposure was early in life. Uh, so that's the IPV base group, where the cost differential does appear to flatten some 19 years or so after the exposure. So to summarise, we do find that women who experience IPV have higher government funded mean health costs over the long term, we saw that the cost differentials generally persist until middle age. Uh, so regardless of whether the IPV was early or later in life. And I've talked through most of these points, uh, but I did want to mention the last one. What we see is, uh, what we did was determine whether IPV status was statistically significant, was a statistically significant predictor for actual costs, and here we looked at MBS and PBS together, even after controlling for confounders. So the way we did this was set up a regression model. Uh, we used a generalized linear mix model, and we found that even after we controlled for age, marital status, area, education, and ability to manage on income, and also this chronic illness factor, that the cost differential for IPV was indeed statistically significant. Uh, and the cost differential was 23%. So in conclusion, even after you've controlled for potential confounders, there was a impact of IPV status on this cost and a significant one. So if I just move on to uh, the results of the micro simulation now, uh, this graphic is uh, just displaying the difference between the mean lifetime cost by IPV status for MBS and PBS. And you can see here again by the confidence intervals uh, that that difference was significant. Uh, and again, this is the output of the micro simulation. Now, just to put some figures to this, uh, we found that for women with a lifetime history of IPV, the mean lifetime cost differential was 29% uh, or around $26,000 for MBS and 27% or around the $10,000 mark for PBS. Uh, so while, the, while those numbers may not seem that big, when you actually apply it uh, to even just this cohort, so I'm now talking about the 7,557 women that we used for this modelling exercise, we find that this equates to a health cost burden of 85.7 million. And approximately 90% of that is expected to be paid after 2018. And that just goes to how much of our health burden is later in life. And interestingly, this holds despite the lower life expectancy associated with IPV, which we were able to observe in the older ALSH cohort. Uh, and furthermore, if you extrapolate what we, uh, the results that we have derived for those lifetime costs to the population, using a conservative IPV prevalence estimate of 20%, the lifetime cost burden is 5.7 billion. Uh, and so we've just looked at ABS statistics for women born uh, 1973 to 1978. So it's a very small age group. Um, there's just a, a five year or six year age group there. Uh, and uh, even for that small cohort, we find that there's a very large cost uh, associated with the IPV. Uh, now, in conclusion, um, our findings strongly support uh, the conclusion that adverse health impacts of IPV do translate to increased health costs over the lifetime. 
even when the IPV exposure uh, is early in life. Uh, so what we found was that the cost differential was statistically significant and did persist over a 23 year study period for MBS. Uh, and there was evidence of early adversity preceding the first report of violence. Now I'm well aware that we have uh, many policy experts uh, in the room. Uh, so you will have some great ideas, I'm sure, on what type of policy you can make off the back of this. But we do suggest that interventions early in the life of women who experience IPV or abuse are likely to improve their lifetime health outcomes and correspondingly potentially reduce long-term funded government costs. Ultimately, we think there are more cost-effective ways um, of supporting these women. Good to Thank you, Janani. Um, I think those findings are quite striking and um, yeah, as you say, quite remarkable. We had two questions with notice that were provided to us uh, before uh, the presentation today. And the first of those is, what are the main physical and mental health impacts of violence against women? And I'll speak a little bit to some of the many uh, symptoms and chronic conditions that have been associated with domestic violence. And then I might hand to you, Janani, to just again reiterate those healthcare cost uh, statistics. Um, so I said previously, um, suicidal ideation and self-harm, depression and anxiety, and a constellation of mental health problems have been associated with domestic violence. And what we find is overall mental health related quality of life is actually compromised by experiences of domestic violence. And I mentioned last year, and Janani reiterated in her presentation, that as far as we can tell, um, at this point, after 23 years, those health deficits associated with domestic violence um, still remain. So we're looking at 23 years past the point of first experiencing violence and still seeing that deficit in mental health. Similarly, um, the results are reflected in uh, bodily pain and physical function. Um, so women who have experiences of domestic violence um, have an associated deficit compared with women who've never had those experiences. Um, in terms of chronic conditions, some of the ones that we've identified with the data include cervical cancer, um, chronic bowel disorders, um, I mentioned breathing problems uh, previously, um, and uh, emphysema and low iron and cardiovascular disease have all been associated uh, with domestic violence. Importantly, there's also a strong association between domestic violence and the use of tobacco, um, something that requires a little bit more unpacking. And I'll just turn to you, Janani, to see if you'd like to um, contribute to that. Unmuted, is that all good? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Deb. Yes, so as I spoke through in the presentation, uh, if I just start with the act, what we call the actual cost, so that's just what you observe in the data before we've done any modelling. Uh, and you can probably recall uh, the graphs that I put up for IPV based, so they're women that have experienced IPV quite early in their life, so prior to the first survey uh, in the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health, which was in 1996. They're aged about 18 to 23. Uh, and in the other group, we looked at women who had reported on violence after the survey. And you could see there was a, a clear difference in cost, just the raw observed cost between those two groups. Over the 23-year study period, but that difference was about 20 to 40 percent, depending on the year. It varied by year. Uh, and overall, it was about 20 percent. Uh, and that covers uh, a, a range, all, all, the, um, benef all the services rather that are available through Medicare. Uh, with PBS, there was more uh, volatility. You saw that as well in those graphs because uh, there are much lower amounts in there. Once we apply some models to this, so one of the models I mentioned is uh, one where we control for other demographic factors, uh, so things like age, marital status and so forth, and also um, control for a health factor through the chronic illness uh, factor in those models, we still see uh, that IPV status has a statistically significant impact on uh, total costs. That was MPS and PBS costs. Uh, and that cost potential uh, was 23%. Uh, and then, of course, the final part of that study looked at projecting all of these costs over the lifetime. Uh, and that final result that we came up with was a cost differential of 29% for MBS uh, and 27% for PBS. So still uh, quite high uh, 
Um, and as we saw in the again in the actual results, that cost uh, differential persisted over a very long period of time. Uh, so all the, the um, health issues that Deb's just spoken about uh, do play out in terms of resulting in higher health system costs overall. You're muted. Thank you. You'd think after months and months that I wouldn't do that, and yet I still do. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, so, Janani, I think one of the things we've mentioned before and that we've talked about um, has been what can we do now to prevent um, some of those conditions playing out over the course of women's lives, which will improve their quality of life, but also save the health system costs. Um, and I think when we look at um, things like health behaviour, that gives us one clue, uh, but also what are the services that potentially um, could be provided that might prevent um, those chronic conditions getting worse or the symptoms um, continuing over time? Um, and they're questions, I think, um, that are worthy of further discussion. Um, can I please ask, somebody posted a question for Janani earlier and unfortunately it disappeared off the polyv. So if someone could, the person who did that could please repost it. That would be great. Um, our second question uh, we've noticed was, would a separate Medicare item number help in tracking the impacts of violence against women? And we also talked about this um, and decided that it's such a complicated question. It's an excellent question, but there are so many different ways we could answer it. And what we would really like to do is to discuss that with the person or people who raised that question um, so that we can um, talk about that in more detail, but also in context. We have another question here which asks, how much uncertainty is there in the 29% or $26,000 per woman increase that is associated with IPV? Do you have a 95% CI? But uh, can you hear me? Is that all good? Yes. That is such um, a great question, uh, such a statistical question too. Uh, what I would say is, uh, in simple terms, yes, uh, and it is in the paper, I don't have it at hand. Uh, the way that the micro simulation is built is such that you can run hundreds of simulations. Uh, and so that's how we derive uh, those confidence intervals. Um, in, in terms of, is there a lot of uncertainty around that number? It's, it's hard to directly answer uh, that question, but what we do see, uh, not just in that statistic or in that uh, result that we get, but across the board, is that this cost differential is statistically uh, is statistically significant. No matter how we look at it, um, you do see a difference between the health costs uh, used for women who experience IPV versus those. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Janetti. No worries. Any more questions? Yep. Okay, we have one more question. Were there, oops, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, so this is again for you, Janani. Um, someone wanted to check in on whether your research works from a definition of violence or includes the broader definitions that Deb mentioned at the beginning, including mental abuse, coercion, etc. Yes, another another really great question. Uh, we use the measure that's asked in the ALSH uh, surveys in the young, the 1973 to 1978 birth cohort. It's asked every survey. I'm just trying to get the wording for you now, but it's along the lines of, have you ever uh, experienced violence from a partner or spouse? So it's really up to the individual reading that question uh, to interpret it uh, as they see fit. Um, so it's hard to, again, directly answer that question, uh, but it does ask about violence with a partner or spouse, and it's all about how that woman, woman interprets what violence is. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth mentioning that that's probably the most conservative measure of violence that we have, um, so it's likely to underestimate violence to some extent. Um, is the simplest measure to use in the sorts of analyses I think that you're doing, Janani, yeah. but we do in fact include um, broad measures of domestic violence, particularly for the younger two cohorts, which we've used in um, other research. Um, so we have another question here for you, Janani. 
any particular MBS or PBS items that displayed much higher usage among women who had reported IPV, or is that beyond the scope of this particular analysis? Again, another great question. Uh, we didn't focus too much on, on looking at the types of services that are underpinning these higher costs, but it's a great question. There have been other studies that have looked at that. And I can refer to some of them. If, if anyone's interested in, in that specific area, I'm happy to um, email you. Uh, but what I will say is uh, it's very clear that there is uh, a higher rate of mental health services being used by women who experience IPV. Uh, Deb's also looked at, she's actually the expert here, she's actually looked at this in a lot more detail, uh, but for an older cohort. Uh, she might be able to speak on that. Uh, yeah, so some research we did some years ago now showed much higher use of GP services uh, compared uh, with women who hadn't experienced domestic violence, uh, but also specialist services and services in hospital. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with your hospital's analysis, Janani, when you finish that. Uh, I think overall services um, were increased, obviously, uh, for women who'd lived with domestic violence, but what we saw in our previous research was the highest increase, I think, among um, women accessing general practitioners. But it's certainly something that I think that we can look at in more detail um, as we get the opportunity to keep analysing the data. Yeah. And I'm just going to check if we have any more questions. Okay. We don't have any more questions at the moment. Was there anything you wanted to add, Janani? Uh, um, yeah, I think... Uh, just going back to the question that was posed to us, Deb, I think uh, we also had a brief uh, inter email uh, conversation about this. It's a very good question and it's worthwhile discussing further. What I did want to emphasize is that what we see is uh, there's a whole range of conditions that women experience uh, when, when they go through uh, something as traumatic as being in a relationship that's violent. Uh, and it, it's a real uh, sort of holistic assessment needs to be made uh, for this woman. It's uh, very difficult to uh, pin down any specific health issue that she has because it's so wide ranging. Uh, so in terms of what uh, people might be thinking about uh, to do off the back of this, uh, I think we really do need to think about it um, with that kind of holistic perspective um, and understand that there's a whole wide range of health issues that will affect uh, women that go through this. I think that's a very good point. Um, so we do have another question, um, if, which is related. If women who go on to experience violence have higher costs before it occurs, yes. does it indicate com a common risk factor? Or do women's accounts of their experience change over time? Um, I might take that first uh, yeah. and just say, yes, women's accounts of their experience do change over time. We were fortunate enough um, to do some work with DSS around how women respond to questions about violence. The more often you ask women about it, the more likely you are to get a disclosure of domestic violence. Um, and we also found that asking questions about domestic violence are in and of themselves quite triggering. So depending on women's emotional state on the day, they may or may not uh, respond in the affirmative uh, to questions about violence. One, one of the concluding um, points from that report was that the more you ask, the more accurate the results, and that women tend to not um, give false positive responses, but you do get false negative responses yeah. to some extent. Um, with regard to the question, the first part of the question about women who go on to experience violence having compromised health before the violence occurs, we're currently having a look at adversities and abuse that occurs in childhood, which we already know is related to later experiences of violence. And I think that will answer some of that question. Is there something you'd like to add to that, Janani? No, I, I completely agree. I think they're the two two things that are going on there. One is around the reporting, um, and Deb's already covered that. And the second thing is, uh, we definitely need to look at what happened uh, prior to that young adulthood period. What, what's going on uh, in childhood and in um, adolescence? And Deb's mm. all, all over that. <laughs> Thanks, Janetti. Do we have any other questions? We have no other questions um, at the moment. 
Um, I will, we will stay on for another minute or so. Um, and I'll just um, mention that uh, we remain eternally grateful to the participants in our study for their disclosures of abuse. Um, they often write accounts of their abuse experiences and the last page of the survey in the free text comments. And we've been able to look at those over the years to determine um, some of the things that aren't captured by scales. We haven't talked about it today, but I will just touch on elder abuse. Um, we found certainly you will have seen in the initial slide that women who have experienced domestic violence who are older, now in their 90s, much less inclined to talk about experiences of domestic violence. Yet on their last page, they write accounts of experiences that would clearly be defined as domestic violence. Um, they just don't name it as such. Um, so I think that the way that women report violence has certainly changed over time. And we capture that um, in, to some extent in the quantitative data, but the qualitative data are also are really good at informing our understanding of what's going on among this community of women who have been so generous in sharing their experiences. I'm going to have one last check of the Polev and there are no more questions. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for their time today and thank you, Janani, for taking time out uh, from your, your work at ANU. Um, I'm sorry, I've just got a note that there are actually more questions. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we're in on live television. <laughs> <laughs> I will just note that the, the videos uh, from this series of seminars will be made available um, to people who are interested in seeing them. We've also been talking about maybe loading them up on the Longitudinal Studies YouTube channel. Um, and I'll give a plug to tomorrow's lunchtime seminar, which is about reproductive health, and the one on Friday, which is about the COVID-19 survey results. So some preliminary results from our COVID survey that we've put out this year on a fortnightly basis. Um, I've still got the, the little wheel thing that turns while it waits to upload questions. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say, Janani? Um. Not, not at this stage, no, I, I understand I'm putting you on the spot. We had a good discussion earlier this year um, with the Social Outcomes Lab yeah. and there were some great ideas there around uh, bringing policy, practice and research together and bringing them all to bear um, on issues to do with women's experiences of violence and the very long-term impact um, that that has. And we have... A question that says, does a longitudinal study impact only apply to those who experience family and domestic violence as adults, or do these impacts also apply to those women who experience this as a child? Other research has implied an increased risk if you experienced it as a child. Um, and I think our data do actually bear that out. So you can see associations between adversity in childhood and abuse in childhood and later experiences of domestic violence, including witnessing domestic violence as a child. So we are unpacking some of that at the moment um, and doing some more in-depth analyses in that area um, because, yes, I think the longitudinal impact does, in fact, apply um, to any experience of violence, um, and we're currently looking at the evidence for that to try and determine the extent and the length of those impacts and the interplay between abuse in childhood and abuse in adulthood. And another Another question along similar lines, it would be great to hear a bit more about the intergenerational impacts you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And I think I just covered some of that. Um, I, we are currently working on uh, looking at the long-term cumulative um, impact of abuse over the life course. It involves incredibly complicated statistics um, to tease those out. And I think... Uh, so we're taking that micro simulation approach we're modelling individuals over their lifetime. Um, I actually, what I will say is there's a lot of health economists that have looked at this type of model when they're looking at disease prevention. I haven't seen it so much uh, in the IPV space. I hope that answers the question. I also just wanted to add um, a couple of things to the previous question uh, with the generational data. Uh, so we did actually look at the older generations of ALSH when we looked at this cost differential. It's not written up in the report. And you do, do see those cost differentials play out in the um, 1946 to 1951 cohort as well. Uh, on the other question on um, experiencing adversity or violence early in childhood, I will draw your attention to uh, one, I think, one of the most powerful 
uh, outcomes of this research, which was looking at the women that experience uh, IPV prior to that first survey period. So we labelled them IPV base. So it, what that means is that uh, their first experience of uh, IPV was before the age of 18 to 23. So that's uh, the, the uh, well, that's the ages that they were when they were in that first survey. Um, so I guess for many of them, that's, that's adolescence, that's early adulthood. Uh, and you'll see there on average that that cost differential is is exists and it also persists over a very long period of